Welcome to the opening press conference of the International Transport Forum's 2022 Summit on in Transport for Inclusive Societies. My name is Michael Claude. I'm the head of communications of ITF. Um, I'm partly responsible for the fact that you are here. The real reason is that we have very many illustrious visitors with us who will speak on the topic and introduce the summit. And I will not waste any time but introduce uh, our speakers. We have uh, um, the Minister of Morocco, which is the presidency country of the International Transport Forum. Bienvenue, Monsieur le Ministre. We have uh, Mr. Volker Wissing, who's the federal minister, and that's important in Germany, of transport and of digital infrastructure and transport, that way around. We have with us uh, Mr. Yang Tae Kim, the secretary general of the International Transport Forum, and uh, Mr. Omar Al Ghab, who's the minister of transport of Canada. So, very illustrious uh, round here. Um, I'll go right away to Monsieur le Ministre du Maroc uh, to present to us the topic of the International Transport Forum's 22 Summit, Inclusive Transport, Transport for Inclusive Societies. Monsieur le Ministre. Thank you very much. Excellence, Monsieur le Ministre, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général, Mesdames et Messieurs, je voudrais d'abord vous souhaiter la bienvenue à cette conférence de presse. Je suis très heureux de m'adresser à vous pour lancer les travaux de ce grand rassemblement annuel du FIT. Et je me réjouis de pouvoir vous rencontrer en personne après ces deux années de crise sanitaire. Je tiens également à remercier le gouvernement fédéral allemand pour l'accueil de ce sommet, et tout particulièrement M. Volker Wissing, le ministre de l'Infrastructure numérique et du Transport. J'aimerais remercier aussi M. Yun Tae Kim, le secrétaire général du FIT et toute l'équipe de son secrétariat pour leur engagement à promouvoir le dialogue mondial sur les politiques de transport. Le Maroc a adhéré au FIT en 2015. Ceci nous a permis de participer et de contribuer aux discussions sur des sujets qui intéressent plus que jamais l'ensemble des pays du monde. La mobilité partagée, l'écomobilité, la mobilité douce, les transports verts, l'innovation, les nouvelles technologies dans les transports et bien d'autres. Ce sont là des sujets qui nécessitent de nouvelles générations de stratégies, de plans d'action, une gouvernance réinventée. Nombreux de ces sujets, nous avons essayé déjà de les traduire en initiatives et en plans d'action à l'échelle du Royaume du Maroc. La participation du Maroc aux activités du FIT a été également l'occasion de bénéficier de l'initiative de la décarbonation des transports dans les économies émergentes qui avait été conduite par le FIT, financée par le ministère fédéral allemand pour l'environnement, que je remercie ici. Dans le cadre de ce projet, des mesures pertinentes ont été proposées pour réduire nos émissions de gaz à effet de serre, ainsi que des modèles pour évaluer l'impact. Je voudrais saisir également l'occasion de cette conférence de presse pour réitérer mes remerciements aux pays membres qui ont permis au Maroc d'avoir l'honneur de présider ce FIT 21-22. Le thème de ce sommet, le transport pour les sociétés inclusives, est choisi pour débattre du transport au service de tous, surtout après ces années Covid qui ont engendré de grands changements dans nos habitudes et dans la vie de nos sociétés. Le défi est de taille, comment adapter la mobilité et les transports pour favoriser un accès équitable de tous aux services des transports et par conséquent aux autres activités économiques et services de base, et plus particulièrement les populations de zones enclavées ou les personnes à mobilité réduite. Pour relever ce défi, il est indispensable de renforcer le rôle des transports pour en faire un véritable vecteur d'accès aux biens et aux activités économiques et sociales. Le sommet de cette année nous permettra sans doute de tenir un dialogue productif pour mieux cerner la question sur l'inclusion et le rôle que devra jouer le transport pour favoriser un accès facile, sécurisé et de qualité pour l'ensemble des catégories de la population. C'est aussi une occasion de réfléchir ensemble aux nouvelles solutions de mobilité pour favoriser l'inclusion de nos sociétés en tirant profit des avantages que, prof... que procurent pardon, les nouvelles technologies. Enfin, je souhaite plein succès à notre sommet et vous invite à nous rejoindre pour la session plénière sur les transports comme catalyseur des sociétés inclusives. Merci à tous. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Ministre. Thank you so much for this, this opening statement. 
And uh, following an old tradition here at ITF, the presidency uh, has the first occasion, occasion <laughs> to, to speak to us, and the second is always the host country, which is Germany. So, Minister Wissing, the floor is yours. Ja, herzlichen Dank, sehr geehrter Herr Kluth, verehrter Herr Präsident, verehrter Herr Kollege, verehrter Herr Generalsekretär, meine Damen und Herren. Inklusion ist für mich schon lange ein Herzensthema. Es freut mich, dass das Internationale Transportforum es als einen Schwerpunkt gesetzt hat. Es passt in diesem Jahr nicht nur besonders gut im Hinblick auf unsere Solidarität mit der Ukraine, sondern auch, wenn es um wichtige Mobilitätsfragen geht. Es geht letztlich bei der Inklusionsfrage im, im Verkehrsbereich um die Frage der Freiheit, der Gleichheit und der Teilhabe. Freiheit braucht Mobilität. In einer Gesellschaft, die zusammenhält und inklusiv ist, wird niemand vergessen. Inklusion bedeutet für mich, dass jeder die gleichen Chancen hat. Jeder muss etwa die Möglichkeit haben, problemlos von seinem Wohnort zur Ausbildungsstätte, zur Schule, zur Arbeit zu kommen. Gerade in ländlichen Gebieten ist das unsere Aufgabe für die entsprechende Infrastruktur zu sorgen. Nur wer mobil sein kann, ist auch in der Lage, sein Leben eigenständig zu organisieren. Die Infrastruktur ist das eine. Mobilität darf aber auch kein Luxusgut sein. Mobilität, auch klimafreundliche Mobilität, muss bezahlbar bleiben für jede und jeden. In Deutschland starten wir dafür im kommenden, Jahr ein großes, im kommenden Monat Entschuldigung, ein großes Experiment. Wir entlasten die Bürgerinnen und Bürger im Bereich der Energiepreise und wir wollen einen besonderen Anreiz setzen, den öffentlichen Personennahverkehr zu nutzen mit einem besonderen Ticket für 9 Euro pro Monat kann man drei Monate lang den öffentlichen Personennahverkehr in ganz Deutschland nutzen. Damit wollen wir erreichen, dass die Menschen schnell zurückkommen zum öffentlichen Personennahverkehr nach dieser Pandemie und zugleich wollen wir einen Anreiz setzen, den öffentlichen Personennahverkehr auszuprobieren, wer ihn noch nicht kennt, um Energie zu sparen. Und wir setzen darauf, dass viele, die positive Erfahrungen damit machen, dauerhaft dabei bleiben und wir damit einen Beitrag zum Klimaschutz leisten. Es ist außerdem eine gemeinsame Online-Plattform geplant, über die dieses besondere Ticket verkauft werden wird. Davon profitieren alle Fahrgäste. Zweitens kann das Ticket ein wichtiger Anreiz sein und es ist für uns auch eine Möglichkeit, in einem Versuch auszuloten, was sind die Gründe, warum nicht noch mehr Menschen bisher den ÖPNV nutzen. Oder wenn Leute auf umgestiegen sind, warum bleiben sie dabei oder warum bleiben sie nicht dabei? Wir werden eine umfangreiche Befragung durchführen im Anschluss an diese drei Monate. Ich habe viele internationale Anfragen, die an mich gerichtet worden sind und wir werden diese Ergebnisse auch international zur Verfügung stellen und sie mit unseren Freunden weltweit teilen. Klar ist, wir müssen den ÖPNV für alle so attraktiv machen, dass die Menschen ihn gerne nutzen. Er ist eine Schlüssellösung auch für klimafreundliche Mobilität. Ich bin davon überzeugt, dass Inklusion dank Innovation leichter möglich wird in den nächsten Jahren. Die Digitalisierung im Verkehrsbereich und das verstärkte Nutzen von Daten werden uns helfen, möglichst allen Menschen ein attraktives, individuelles Angebot zu machen, egal wo sie leben, wie alt sie sind oder ob sie in ihrer Beweglichkeit eingeschränkt sind. Digitalisierung macht es möglich, dass wir Mobilität intelligent miteinander vernetzen. Intermodaler Verkehr wird einfacher durch Digitalisierung. In Deutschland haben wir dafür auch schon rechtliche Dinge auf den Weg gebracht, etwa wenn es um das autonome Fahren geht. An die, am morgigen Freitag wird, äh, nee, an diesem Freitag, diese Woche übermorgen, wird unsere Verordnung zum autonomen Fahren im Bundesrat beschlossen. Damit werden wir in Deutschland flächendeckend Level 4 Anwendungen im Bereich des autonomen Fahrens auf allen öffentlichen Straßen zulassen. So viel ich weiß, sind wir Frontrunner mit diesem Projekt. Wir wollen, dass schnell die Möglichkeiten des autonomen Fahrens genutzt werden, etwa indem man autonom fahrende Shuttles nutzt, die uns helfen, auch wirklich mehr Angebot in den Städten oder darüber hinaus zu machen. Uns ist es wichtig, dass wir auch dabei die Inklusion fest im Blick haben. Wir müssen die Fragen gleich alle mitdenken, etwa woran erkennen blinde Menschen, dass sie in den richtigen autonomen Shuttle einsteigen? Sind alle Fahrzeuge auch für Rollstuhlfahrer geeignet oder müssen sie am Ende stundenlang auf die wenigen 
behindertengerechten Shuttle warten? Sind die Buchungssysteme so aufgebaut, dass auch wirklich jeder sie intuitiv und problemlos nutzen kann? Das sind Fragen, die wir mitdenken müssen und die wir auch mitdenken wollen. Ich bin jedenfalls davon überzeugt, dass die Digitalisierung und innovative Mobilitätslösungen das Leben für uns alle verbessern können. Und ich bin sehr daran interessiert, dass wir diese Dinge eben auch hier im Internationalen Transportforum untereinander besprechen, uns austauschen. Das tun wir in vielen Bilaterals. Und es sind auch schon hier heute Gespräche geführt worden, wo wir uns zugesagt haben, uns intensiver auszutauschen. Wir machen beispielsweise in Deutschland den Aufbau der Ladesäuleninfrastruktur nicht einfach, indem wir die Distanzen zwischen den Ladesäulen vorgeben, sondern indem wir einen digitalen Datenschatz nutzen, um anhand des individuellen Mobilitätsverhaltens unserer Bevölkerung zu identifizieren, an welcher Stelle brauchen wir wie viele Ladesäulen. Wenn wir das einfach nur im Abstand von bestimmten Kilometern machen, ist das sehr grob. Wenn wir aber das individuelle Mobilitätsverhalten von A nach B unserer eigenen Bevölkerung und auch der Touristen, die bei uns sind, analysieren, dann haben wir eine passgenaue Lösung. Und diese Systeme, die wir hier aufgebaut haben, teilen wir gerne mit unseren Freunden auch im Internationalen Transportforum, weil ja bei der Digitalisierung, wir alle wissen, je mehr Daten wir haben und je mehr wir international zusammenarbeiten, umso präziser arbeiten diese Systeme. Und das ist unser gemeinsamer Auftrag, mit Hilfe der heute vorhandenen technologischen Lösungen den größten Mehrwert für die Bevölkerung zu schaffen, indem wir ihr maximal Mobilitätsangebote bieten und die alle inklusiv. Vielen Dank. Vielen Dank, vielen Dank Minister Wissing. Thank you very much. Minister, very interesting projects going on in Germany and many will be asking you about them, I guess. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome my Secretary General, Dr. Young Tae Kim, to uh, welcome guests and tell us what the ITF is doing for transport and inclusive societies. Young Tae. Monsieur le Ministre Abdel Jalil and Mr. Visink and Ms. Al Gabra. And friends of uh, ITF, uh, thank you for joining us for the opening press conference of ITF Summit 2022. And after a two-year hiatus due to the pandemic, the world's premier transport policy event and largest meeting of transport ministers on the globe is back, back again in, in person. And this is a moment of great joy. But I'm also deeply saddened that we meet while a war rages in less than 1,000 kilometers from Leipzig and bombs destroy bridges, roads, ra railways, and ports, and infrastructure which were created to bring people together and enable mutually beneficial trade. This war does the opposite of what we, the transport community, are doing for. But I want to express my profound gratitude to the Kingdom of Morocco and to Minister Abdeljali personally. And this is a historic occasion, the first ever ITF summit under the presidency of an African nation. And Morocco has ably steered the ITF through difficult waters over the past year and prepared this summit with enormous savoir-faire and charm. And I also wish to express my profound gratitude to Germany as always, and to Minister Wissing, who supported us in this preparation of the summit. And Germany has been the summit's valued host country since 2008, and its hospitality and support are exemplary. And here are some uh, summit facts. Uh, we, don't, we don't have uh, many of the statistics yet, but more than over 800 delegates attend this year, and 53 nations are represented. So we will update the statistics, statistics more. And uh, as you know, the summit theme this year is a transport for inclusive societies. And around the world, the social fabric of societies has become thinner and fewer and fewer things seem to unite us, more and more appear to divide us. So what can bring us back together? So I posit that transport is one of the most powerful forces that we possess to unite and unify. So good transport, like good education, is a great enabler of human opportunity. Physical mobility is often closed link to with uh, social mobility. And good transport systems leave no one behind. And good transport systems are not built with only healthy males aged 25 to 50. 
At this summit, the ITF present three projects that help make transport and thus our societies more inclusive. This morning, we launched a website to help disabled motorists plan their trips in collaboration with FIA. And over one billion people live with disabilities, many travel by car, but face different rules in different countries. So this website helps them to plan their trips. At the ITF stand, you can test our new accessibility tool that compares nearly 100 cities for the ease of access to schools, jobs, shops, parks, and more. And city officials can now see at a glance where to improve and from which cities they can learn. And here and now, I'd like to present to you the new ITF gender analysis toolkit for transport. The women use transport in different ways than men. But transport plans, projects, and policies rarely reflect this fact because we have uh, much more the men policymakers, the high level policymakers in, in most of the countries. So when they try to, uh, planners often lack gender disaggregated data for informed decisions. And our toolkit provides easy to use instruments to integrate a gender perspective from the get go. And I have decided that ITF will apply this toolkit systematically to all our future projects. When it comes to gender mainstreaming in transport, and Canada is a world leader, and we have drawn much inspiration for this project for, from exchanging with Canadian colleagues. So I'm thrilled that we have with us Mr. Omar Algabra, Canada's Minister of Transport, and he has kindly agreed to share with us how Canada has gender transport and with what results. And after Minister Algabra, my colleague Magda Olzak will take us through the ITF Gender Analysis Toolkit. So, Minister Algabra, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Bonjour à tous. Thank you, Minister Abjelil. Minister Wissing, Secretary General Kim for opening the summit for all of us. I'd like to thank the International Transport Forum for its excellent work organizing this year's event. And thank you for the opportunity to highlight Canada's support for the ITF Gender Analysis Toolkit for Transport. The last two years have been hard and women and girls around the world have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we recover, in order to truly build back better, we must create policies that work for everyone. For governments to have a real positive impact, we must develop initiatives through a lens that takes into account gender and diversity. And that's exactly what Gender-Based Analysis Plus does in Canada. GBA Plus is an essential tool that, is, that, is un, that underlies every policy and initiative in Canada. When we use GBA, we are challenging our assumptions, asking questions, and considering the diversity of Canadians and the impacts our programs and policies might have on them. And when we use this perspective in transport projects, planning and policy, it makes sure everyone is included. Because we know that diversity in our transportation network is critical for our competitiveness, especially in our supply chains. And I'm proud to say that in Canada's transportation sector, we are prioritizing diversity and representation. But there's more work to do. There are still too few women in roles such as pilots, mariners, and truckers. In our commercial trucking sector, where labor shortages are putting pressure on our supply chains, only 3.5% of truck drivers are women. Diverse workers and policymakers can help supply chains be more resilient, healthy, and competitive. This means more equal representation in the jobs that power the transportation sector. And it works the other way around to attract a gender diverse workforce to jobs that support the supply chain, we need transportation systems that are designed to include them. Recruitment is part of the solution. We're actively encouraging women to apply for non-traditional jobs and using GBA to develop 
these initiatives. For example, today is the first international day for women in maritime. Through the International Maritime Organization, Canada championed the creation of this new international day to honor women in the industry and promote recruitment. Breaking down barriers will make the sector more inclusive and more resilient. Transport Canada is proud to offer this perspective in support of the development of the ITF toolkit. Our officials contributed to surveys, reviewed draft material, and shared lessons learned. They also hosted a webinar to illustrate the GBA Plus process and how we use it in policy and program development. I'd like to congratulate the ITF on this launch. These tools will support governments and transport stakeholders to design gender balanced policies that break down barriers. I wish you a productive forum and look forward to working together to promote inclusivity and make our transport sectors better for everyone. And on a personal note, I just want to say that, you know, we, Canada is certainly proud of all of our work in uh, gender di and diversity, gender inclusiveness and diversity, but we need to stand humbly before you, recognizing that we still have a lot of work to do, even at Canada, even in Canada. And today, the fact that we have four speakers who are men talking about how much more we need to ensure that policymakers are women makes more emphasis or emphasizes the point that we're all trying to achieve. So thank you for uh, putting this issue as a priority and we look forward to continuing our collaboration with you to achieve our goals. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister Agarra. Thank you. And so, Young Tay stole my point about introducing the lady to my left, the secret I'd left until the end, and you made the very good point that I was going to make, but that's okay, that we don't have a gender-balanced panel here, and that is certainly something that we need, need to work on, particularly if we talk about gender. Um, we launched this project today, we've presented it in other fora, but we really launched it today as an online interactive toolkit because transport for inclusive societies for many people out there sounds very abstract. It's not very meaningful. So we've been looking for ways how to actually bring that down, break that down to a level that people can understand. And the motor, uh, Disabled Motorized website was mentioned. We have a second project that you can see at the ITF stand where we show, um, can, you can compare accessibility in 82 countries. For now for Europe, it will be global and see how easily you can reach a hospital, can reach a school, can reach a restaurant, a green space, um, just to make raise awareness for this question of accessibility, which is inclusion at the end. So I'm very, very delighted now to have Magda Olchak, Ranticelli, to be complete, my colleague who's worked on this project from the outset with Canada, with other countries who've provided case studies, uh, to very quickly take us through it. We don't have that much time, but you can go to the ITF stand, actually use it, try it out and see if it works for you. Um, if it doesn't tell us, because it's a work in project, we need to build on it and we want to improve it. Magda, the floor is yours finally. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you for this introduction. And uh, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's my great honor and pleasure to present to you this ITF Gender Analysis Toolkit for Transport Policy. In fact, in the ITF, we consider that gender analysis is the first step towards achieving gender uh, equality. This gender analysis uh, creates a better understanding of the effectiveness of transport policies and how their impact could be varied uh, by gender. But of course, gender analysis uh, remains a challenge. Our recent survey shows that one third of ICD, uh, of ITF uh, countries have national gender strategies or they implement to some extent gender perspective in transport policies. The survey also highlighted that countries need more guidelines and uh, guidelines and um, uh, key um, points in collecting gender data and in designing policies with gender in mind. 
This is why uh, we have designed the tool kit that offers a simple, uh, easy to use tool method for incorporating gender into transport policies, transport uh, projects or uh, plans. So just very briefly, the toolkit consists of three simple uh, tools. The first one is the gender checklist, uh, gender, the second one, gender indicators, and the third one, the gender questionnaire. So just let me walk you through very briefly. The gender checklist, um, so here uh, we will provide uh, the users uh, of the toolkit with a list of uh, questions that can help with initial assessment of how the gender dimension is reflected uh, in policy or in project. At the end, when user uh, answers all the questions that are very simple questions, are, is this very initial, uh, initial uh, assessment, uh, the toolkit provides uh, a gender quality uh, score as a benchmark. So the, this benchmark mark may vary from the very low, um, no gender equality to a uh, high equality uh, score. The second tool, these are the gender indicators, the gender indicators list, uh, and in my view, uh, is the feature of our toolkit. Here, this tool helps to select the user, the indicators that are most, uh, most relevant to give policy, to, uh, to given policy uh, or a given project, whether you work on urban infrastructure, whether uh, you apply the toolkit to aviation, to the road, uh, or whether you are focusing on the transport users or on the transport uh, work, workforce. So this tool um, provides the comprehensive list of gender indicators, including with regard to accessibility, to affordability, uh, safety, security, uh, education and uh, employment, just to uh, name a few. And finally, the third, uh, the third tool, is uh, the gender questionnaire, which is a template to design a survey and data uh, collection processes. And again, this is uh, um, an assessment tool on existing data and uh, policies on gender and transport. And we have used this questionnaire with our member countries to take the stock of gender initiative existing in um, ITF countries. So uh, this is a very general uh, overview. Uh, we will invite you to uh, ITF stand for uh, to use uh, uh, this toolkit. I've just I wanted to highlight that the toolkit is an, a dynamic tool and we would like to improve uh, further um, the toolkit based on the feedback we will be receiving from our stakeholders as they apply uh, the toolkit. Uh, as we believe that all transport stakeholders have a lot to learn from each other in terms of scoring systems, checklists and, uh, and case studies. And um, of course, we developed this toolkit, as um, uh, Minister Gabra already mentioned, in consultation with uh, our member countries. We were very much inspired by all the work that uh, Canada is, do is doing in this regard. So uh, there, was a, there was a great experience uh, and input from Canada, but also from uh, other member countries, including the United Kingdom, including Ireland, and our uh, other stakeholders like Asian Development Bank, Bank and uh, World Bank and the European Commission. So this, with this few information, I invite you to the ITF stand to uh, discuss with you and uh, exchange further on this tool. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Magda. And this invitation, don't leave. Don't leave yet. Now comes your part, the, the questions and the answers. Um, if you have any questions, uh, of a general nature or on specific the project. Uh, we have 10 minutes to do that. I invite also, uh, that's why I'm looking at the screen, we have a Zoom running in parallel if they're online questions, put them in the Q&A and we will uh, try, to, try to answer them as best as we can. There is a room microphone somewhere. My colleague Aline at the back has that. If you would uh, just state your name and your affiliation um, and then we will see who can best answer the question. We'll have to ask ministers to come back on the lectern so maybe we collect a few questions if that's possible. Who wants to ask the first question? Please raise your arm. Who's the icebreaker? Otherwise, I have to ask Aline, who's uh, got the microphone. <laughs> Everything clear? The, I have a question here in the first row. 
lady. Thank you so much. I <laughs> Hi, Magda, and uh, thank you. I'm sorry, I just came in, so my apologies if you've already covered this. In, uh, in the assessment, are you also looking at socioeconomic parameters that are not transport related, but will affect the way that uh, individuals may move, you know? So one example that we're seeing is the time spent on paid and unpaid um, uh, household work and so on and other things as well. Just. Mm. Do you want to answer directly or? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, yes, so this uh, indicators, uh, we have like 27 indicators and uh, there, there are different categories. Yes, and exactly. We are looking at these different, uh, the, this, this different parameters, um, uh, as you mentioned. So we will be very happy to, uh, to talk to you uh, about this. Yeah. Can I, I can see a Mexican, a Mexican friend? Please. Hello, everyone. I'm Juan Tolentino from Expansión Mexico. Um, I wonder, Magda, if uh, have you identified some good and bra bad practices in terms of uh, the making of public policy in, in transport? And one example of this is because in Mexico, one uh, policy is to separate men from women in the public transport to avoid the, the, the arrestment. So, uh, I don't know if you have identified these these kind of practices in, in in countries like this. Thank you. Great. Maybe we take a maybe we take a second question. If there's another one, I can see. Uh, yes, from Israel. Hi. Um, could you example about the test cases uh, from which you have learned? That was a very straightforward and good question. And Maga, I hand over to you again. Yes, so uh, perhaps I will start first with the question from Mexico uh, about this separation um, uh, in the transport uh, for, for men and, and for women. Uh, of course, uh, we haven't been looked, uh, looking at the specific uh, case study, but uh, this is the next steps, uh, how we will be implementing the toolkit. And uh, of course, this is... Um, the, this is, um, we would be very happy to, to discuss with you uh, the, on, on, this, on the case studies. Uh, there, the toolkit is referring with the, in, as a part of the indicators on uh, safety and security. And of course, we know that across uh, uh, all the countries, question of safety uh, is an important one. And uh, in most of the countries across the world, almost 80% of women have experienced uh, some form of, uh, of harassment. Uh, so uh, definitely uh, we may be looking for the future of how to uh, get the best practices and uh, case studies, how to tackle uh, effectively this issue. Uh, for the second question uh, about the test cases, uh, you were referring to, could you please uh, elaborate a little bit uh, on this question it's a, uh, it's with regard to road yes safety. yes if you can uh, please example uh, about um, the cases around the world about the uh, planning f about uh, um, the gender planning uh, right, uh, uh, good good practices and uh, in fact the toolkit uh, uh, in addition to these three tools that I have just presented, we'll um, provide some examples uh, from our member countries, and we already have, it includes already the example from, uh, from Canada, uh, and uh, from the World Bank, uh, from the um, Asian Development Banks. So uh, there are some good case studies on how uh, on the toolkit, existing toolkit as um, uh, GBA uh, Gender Plus and uh, other tools to uh, incorporate the gender in the transport planning. Maybe you can add, uh, you can confirm this. I think the ADB is also planning yes. to, to use this, this toolkit. We've worked with the Asian Development Bank, so it's very much forward looking. You know, kind of, there is not a lot of experience with this. This is a new topic. Um, but as Yang Tae said, we are going to implement this for ITF projects. So when someone starts to work on a 
um, port project somewhere, you know, you do this checklist and we just have this change of mindset that Mr. Agava was, was referring to. And if ADB does the same, I think that's, that's already something that can be very impactful. Yes, exactly. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that this toolkit is dynamic. So, and the key is uh, our exchange with our member countries, with our stakeholders, gathering the data, gathering the best uh, practices. So, the toolkit is just the first steps, but then uh, it's about this policy dialogue, about exchanging uh, and about learning from each other. So, this is uh, the next step. I have a question here online from Faisal Farouk, who asks, and I'll just read it out, since it's interesting. How has new digital technology and data enabled us to fundamentally rethink questions of inclusion? What are the examples of the new possibilities policymakers need to consider that challenges past models and assumptions? So how does technology come into it? Minister Agaba, is that something you want to talk about? I, you mentioned uh, technology or Minister Vissing. May can I invite you? To? <laughs> uh, look, uh, obviously technology offers more tools and more information for us to get accurate or more accurate information as we do the analysis. So uh, uh, for a long time, um, we had perceptions or anecdote, anecdotal evidence. Uh, however, technology now is able to, pro to provide aggregates and trends and patterns, and that helps us develop more informed policies. Uh, and again, challenge the status quo as we are developing additional or enhancing policies. So, um, I, you know, I can Think of an example, I'm not sure if technology is the best one for it, but I'll, uh, one of the recent uh, policies that we've had to test when it comes to gender uh, uh, base analysis is the north. Canada has a vast remote north. And because of COVID-19, uh, first of all, most of the north needs um, um, aviation access. They don't have road access, they don't have rail access, and they need to fly in and out of communities. Um, we know that lack of transportation um, uh, mode for women or has significantly dis uh, disproportionately affected women in the north more than men. And that helped drive us to have more concrete policies on how to support the aviation sector and including providing subsidies to the North to ensure that women are not disproportionately and negatively impacted by lack of uh, aviation transportation mode to the North. That excellent example. Thank you very much. Minister Wissing, you talked a lot about digital as well. Would you like to say something? Or? Thank you. Die Digitalisierung bietet uns enorme Möglichkeiten, präziser zu werden und auch ähm, vielfältige Angebote alltagstauglich zu machen. Ich hatte vorhin ein Beispiel genannt, wie wir äh, für Elektromobilität in allen Regionen eine Lademöglichkeit schaffen, indem wir ganz präzise äh, Daten nutzen, um herauszufinden, wo diese Lademöglichkeiten gebraucht werden. Digitalisierung bietet uns auch die Möglichkeit, in entfernteren Regionen, in weniger dicht besiedelten Regionen, wo wir keinen intensiven Verkehr haben, mit On-Demand-Services aufgrund digitaler Technologien präzise Angebote zu machen. Und das brauchen wir zunehmend. Also wir, um ein Beispiel zu nennen, wir sind im Moment dabei, in der Testphase im Carsharing-Bereich ein System zu entwickeln, das die Fahrzeuge ferngesteuert zu den Kunden bringt. Das heißt, man bestellt sein ähm, carsharing vehicle äh, direkt zu sich nach Hause. Das wird telegesteuert, fährt auf öffentlichen Straßen telegesteuert und von, man kann dann zu Hause losfahren, auch wenn man in einem kleinen Ort wohnt, äh, wo man nicht erwarten kann, dass man im Umkreis von ein oder zwei Kilometern ein geparktes Fahrzeug seines Carsharing-Anbieters mhm. findet. Das bietet natürlich äh, Möglichkeiten, äh, 
individuelle Angebote zu machen, Menschen einen mitzunehmen, sie ähm, teilhaben zu lassen. Und deswegen ähm, finde ich solche Systeme extrem hilfreich, um inklusive Mobilitätsangebote zu machen. Und diese Systeme basieren eben auf Daten, auf ähm, teilweise künstlicher Intelligenz. Und äh, diese Sachen brauchen wir, ähm, um, um voranzukommen in diesem Bereich. Und natürlich, wenn Sie jetzt dieses Beispiel nehmen, das ich eben gesagt habe, ist es so, dass diese ferngesteuerten Fahrzeuge auch die Chance bieten, Frauen die in, in, in diese Tätigkeiten zu integrieren. Viele Frauen haben das Problem, dass wenn sie abends beispielsweise als Taxifahrerin unterwegs sind, um sich in diesen Bereich einzubringen, dass sie ein Sicherheitsrisiko haben oder, sich, oder Bedenken haben. Wenn sie aber von einem Office aus ein solches Fahrzeug ferngesteuert zum Kunden bringen können, dann können sie sich in diese Berufe integrieren und haben kein Problem, dass sie aus dem sonstigen Bereich kennen. Und deswegen wollen wir Digitalisierung auch verstärkt nutzen, um solche Inklusionsfragen unserer Gesellschaft zu lösen. Thank you very much, Minister Wissing. Two excellent examples that uh, show the way that, uh, that uh, inclusion can be advanced and progressed. Thank you very much, the ministers, Secretary General, for your time. This was extremely valuable. I hope the audience agrees. Um, this is the end of the opening press conference. Do stay. The next press conference immediately follows. You may have seen on the program we have the call to action on the war in Ukraine. So the topic, uh, the other big topic next to inclusion will be discussed here in just three minutes, five minutes. Thank you so much.